Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos hoy. Soy Lina Salazar, economista líder de la División de Medio Ambiente, Desarrollo Rural y Gestión de Riesgos. Eh, para aquellos que están conectados por el Zoom, eh, decirles que este evento se llevará a cabo en inglés y en español. Vamos a tener traducción simultánea, entonces para que por favor, en caso que deseen activarla, pueden hacer el clic en el icono de globo ubicado en la, en la margen inferior de la pantalla. Bueno, a todos bienvenidos de nuevo a este seminario que ya tiene varias, uh, varias series de Semillas para la Seguridad Alimentaria, organizado por la División de Medio Ambiente, Desarrollo Rural y Gestión de Riesgos del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo. Hoy nos acompañan los colegas del Instituto Internacional de Investigación sobre Políticas Agroalimentarias, IFRI, por sus siglas en inglés, para el lanzamiento del capítulo regional del Informe de Políticas Alimentarias Globales 2024, y el capítulo está dedicado especialmente a América Latina y el Caribe. En el BID estamos convencidos de que el conocimiento y la información son los pilares para desarrollar políticas efectivas con impactos sostenibles. Es por eso que cada año esperamos con muchas ansias la publicación insignia de IFP. Este informe de, de políticas agroalimentarias globales ofrece un examen profundo del estado de los sistemas alimentarios y entrega además recomendaciones sobre políticas públicas localizadas a nivel de región. También este año el informe se centra en un tema muy importante que es en los sistemas alimentarios para dietas saludables y nutrición y es además crítico para la región. Los sistemas alimentarios globales están enfrentando desafíos sin precedentes. Producir suficiente comida para una población en crecimiento, proteger los recursos naturales, erradicar la, la pobreza, ofrecer medios de vida prósperos y ampliar el acceso a dietas saludables y nutritivas. Todo esto mientras además se reducen las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero. No es una tarea nada fácil. En América Latina y el Caribe además, Alrededor del 38% de la población experimenta inseguridad alimentaria severa o moderada y esto representa aproximadamente 247 millones de personas, más de cinco veces la población de Argentina. Además, otros datos recientes también compartidos por la FAO indican que la región tiene el costo más alto para acceder a una dieta saludable y esto implica que aproximadamente el 22% de la población no pueda permitirse acceder a este tipo de dietas. También encontramos problemas de, de, de concurrentes en términos de obesidad, de desnutrición crónica infantil y además de deficiencia de micronutrientes. ¿Cómo podemos abordar estos desafíos y además encontrar oportunidades para la transformación de los sistemas agroalimentarios de manera que se logren dietas sostenibles, saludables y alcancemos la seguridad alimentaria? Bueno, estaremos discutiendo esto y más en el seminario que tenemos hoy. And now I'm going to switch to English to introduce our speakers. Uh, we are very pleased to have our colleagues from IFPRI today. I uh, would like to introduce to Diana Olney. Uh, she's the IFPRI Director of the Nutrition, Diets and Health Unit. Valeria Piñeiro, IFPRI's Regional Representative of the Latin American Region and Senior Research Coordinator. Jeff Leroy. Senior Research Fellow and Gabriela Fretes, Associate Research Fellow, both from the IFPRIS Nutrition, Nutrition, Diets and Health Unit. Additionally, we have a virtual guest today who will provide comments to the presentations. And we have uh, Carolina Trivelli, Principal Researcher of the Peruvian Studies Institute, and they will have a panel discussion with uh, questions and answers from the public and also please send your questions online. Well, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to, to introduce uh, Diana Olney, if Press Director of the Nutrition Diets and Health Units, to present the 2024 Global Food Policy Report with a focus in Latin America and the Caribbean. Please. Hi, thanks so much for inviting us and uh, for giving us the opportunity to share our Global Food Policy Report with you and to highlight some of the findings we have both for the region and then also globally, you know, that can apply to all of the regions in the world. So I'll start by 
just giving a brief overview of the Global Food Policy Report. The, this year's theme, this is IFPRI's annual flagship report, and this year's theme is Food Systems for Healthy Diets and Nutrition. And so for the report, and I'll go into this a little bit, but we tried to take a whole of food systems view along with complementary systems to really figure out how can we achieve improved diets and nutrition outcomes. So the impetus for the theme for this report was the kind of coexistence of multiple nutritional problems, both on the side of kind of undernutrition and deficiency system symptoms such as micronutrient deficiencies that affect about 2 billion people worldwide, while also having issues around overweight and obesity, where we have about 2.2 billion people worldwide who are now overweight and obese. And a large portion of, of that, I mean, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, this is an increasing problem, as you all know, which is also coupled with the still remaining high prevalence of stunting and micronutrient deficiencies in the region. We're also seeing an increase in non-communicable diseases aside from overweight and obesity, including uh, high blood pressure and diabetes that are affecting 1.2 billion and a half a billion people uh, worldwide. And like I said, there's these issues are increasing, but the issues related to undernutrition aren't decreasing, right? It's not that we're seeing kind of a seesawing effect. We're actually seeing an increase in all kinds of issues and a stagnation in some of the, you know, undernutrition issues. So we still need to figure out how to address those, but we also now have the problem of, a, of addressing this overweight and obesity and non-communicable disease problem. What we do know is that poor quality diets are a primary contributor to all forms of malnutrition, undernutrition, overnutrition, NCDs, and it's the leading cause of disease worldwide. So it's been estimated that one in five lives could be saved each year by just improving diets. And so it's, I say just diets is no small feat to improve diets, but it is a critical entry point for kind of reducing disease worldwide. So to improve diets, what do we mean? What we want to achieve is improving sustainable, healthy diets. We want to improve both the health and healthiness of the diets, but we also want to make diets more sustainable. So, you know, as we've had seen this increase in the double burden of malnutrition coupled with climate change, we, we you know, as a, as a community have realized that we need to transform our food systems, not only to meet the nutritional needs, but also to address climate change and environmental pressures that we're, we're facing now. And so healthy diets on their own are those that provide the nutrients needed for active and healthy life, but sustainable healthy diets take into account those environmental impacts of diets. And so to kind of think about, you know, how do we both address nutrition issues, but without putting further pressure on our planet and, and the environment, um, and actually decrease some of that pressure is what we're trying to aim for with addressing sustainable healthy diets rather than just healthy diets on its own. What we've seen in the last decade or two is that diets in low and middle income countries are, you know, that have been traditionally heavily cereal based are rapidly evolving to include higher consumption of ultra processed foods, which can be cereal based, but they can also just be high fat, high sugar uh, type foods. Um, and then we're also seeing an overconsumption of animal source foods in some in some areas. Um, but there's also areas of the world that still could benefit from an increase in, in animal source food intake, especially among nutritionally vulnerable uh, populations like pregnant women and, and young children. So how do we achieve sustainable, healthy diets? We need to address several of the core uh, barriers to healthy diets and sustainable, healthy diets. And you can take these in whichever order you want to take them, but in this in this issue of the Global Food Policy Report, we really wanted to start with people and their diets, and you know what what they're actually eating and how they're how they're choosing those foods. And so we're really starting with the desirability issue, you know, what, how, why, and how people choose to eat what they're eating. And we know that food choices are driven by you know a complex interplay of a person's cognition, their environment, their behavior. And so we know that even when diverse healthy foods are available, accessible and affordable, people still don't choose those foods, right? In some cases they do, and it's just an affordability constraint, but often, I mean, as we can see the, you know, increase in overweight and obesity, people aren't making the healthiest choices, even when they, when they are able to do so. And so we have to kind of address that kind of the complexity of why people choose what they do and how do we actually shift people's behaviors 
to healthier behaviors, to more sustainable behaviors, things like that. And it's no, you know, it's it's a pretty hard thing to 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 do, as we can see. I mean, I don't know of a lot of successful interventions to uh, prevent people from overeating or not eating all the junk food. I mean, I think this is something that is a big challenge for us. Um, the other issue is affordability, and that one's a little more straightforward. I mean, if you can't afford healthy food, you're obviously not going to buy it, and you have to make some, you know, very practical decisions about, you know, do you make sure you meet your calorie needs? Do you kind of focus on, you know, higher quality food but have less of it? Do you pay the school fees versus the the, the food? I mean, so you really, you know, when you have affordability constraints, that's a, a little bit more straightforward, and maybe by reducing those constraints, you can get better diets. Um, but affordability, I think, sometimes is confused with just cost, you know, and, and that's not what it is. It's really the intersection of people's incomes and the cost, right? So you can't just lower cost and increase affordability, maybe, but you also need to think about increasing incomes. That's another way to kind of approach the problem, right? So you can solve the affordability constraint either by increasing incomes or reducing cost, but ideally both. Then we have accessibility, where we know that you know, in a lot of places, consumers aren't close enough to save in diverse sources of, of healthy foods um, and affordable foods. And I think, you know, there's concepts around kind of food deserts and urban environments and rural environments. You know, maybe you have a very, you know, small selection of foods you can buy without having to go to, you know, the next town or the next market. But also in urban areas, there's areas where you only have kind of highly processed foods available easily uh, or just, again, a small selection of, of healthy foods. And sometimes they're also higher priced, right? Like you, you might get a higher price at a local market versus going to kind of a bigger market another town away. So, um, you know, how do we kind of make these foods more accessible to a wider population is also a constraint. And then there's this, a simple availability issue, it's especially related to kind of fruits and vegetables and other uh, high quality foods. There's simply not enough availability of some of these foods in a lot of countries. And so there is still the need to increase the supply of healthy foods, especially sustainable, healthy foods. And then underlying all of this is the policy and governance. And I think Valeria will talk a, about, a bit about this in the Latin American context. But to make any of this work, you also need improvements of, around policy and governance issues to really um, kind of institutionalize any sort of changes that we want to see. So as I mentioned, and I'm not going to try to pretend anyone will read this in detail, but I think, you know, the important thing here that we're trying to illustrate is that we've, as I mentioned, we're using a food systems framework. This has been adapted from the high level panel of experts food systems framework. But what we're trying to do here is really make diet central to this framework. And so it's highlighted there in blue. This is the goal is to improve diets through these food systems transformations. And the purple boxes are all around consumer behaviors, their characteristics. This gets to kind of the desirability, affordability piece. And then in the orange, you have food environments, which Jeff will, will be talking about today in a little more detail. Uh, and that's really the intersection between supply and demand, or where kind of the supply meets the consumers. And so it really kind of presents those opportunities of what people can eat. And then we have the supply side of things and the green boxes, where it's more around the availability uh, of foods and the cost of those foods. And then, of course, we have all the drivers of these, these um, topics and then the policy and governance in orange underlying it. And then what we have over on the, the other side with the green boxes is what we need to also do if we want to actually achieve nutrition outcomes. So we can use food systems to achieve diet outcomes. It's pretty clear. But if you want to actually have impact on nutrition, you likely need to couple those types of in interventions with health systems transformation, social protection systems, other, other types of um, interventions. So in the report, we have several chapters um, of, along that kind of food systems continuum. Uh, we've got a chapter on demand, uh, which really focuses on what approaches can be used to increase demand. And, and what they, the authors found was that they must start with increasing understanding of dietary patterns and their drivers. There's a lot of effort being put into getting individual level dietary intake. Uh, from different countries, this has been missing. You know, usually we have just consumption data, which is household level data. And so there's a, a, a kind of a push to get more individual level data and really understand the drivers of those dietary patterns. And some of the strategies that can be used to increase demand include the use of food-based dietary guidelines, social and behavior change communication, and then multi-sectoral programs like linking food systems activities to 
uh, social protection, women's empowerment activities, things like that. Um, and then you also, there's a, a chapter on addressing affordability, which as I mentioned, we, we know is critical. Um, and this can be achieved by pro-poor economic growth strategies, investments in scaling up social protection programs, and also investments in things like transport, infrastructure, and logistics. Uh, next is the food environments chapter, which uh, Jeff will uh, present on, and Gabby was also a co-author on that, or actually the lead author on that. Um, and as I mentioned, food environments are where supply and demand come together, and thus they play a central role in leveraging food systems for sustainable, healthy diets. Uh, and we know, as I mentioned, that they're undergoing rapid and dramatic transformation. Um, but, you know, because they're kind of undergoing all this transformation, you know, it's really a critical time for us to be thinking about what are these food environments, what kind of interventions can we be uh, implementing in these areas to shift them towards healthier uh, environments. And I'll let Jeff talk more about that. Uh, and then on the supply side, we have two chapters on the supply side, one that's focused on plant-based foods and one that's focused on animal source foods, which Jeff also uh, was a co-author on the animal source foods. Um, but here we focus on how can supply side innovations help limit negative environmental impacts of food systems while meeting the demand for sustainable healthy diets. And some of the approaches that can be used are around investing in crop diversity, such as through intercropping, increasing the use of orphan crops, which are locally produced crops that have been neglected in breeding programs or underutilized, and then also fortification and biofortification of staple crops. And then the yeah, chapter on the animal source foods really focuses on this kind of dichotomy of the overconsumption and the underconsumption and how can we actually meet both, you know, kind of address both issues. And then also across the board, there's issues around food safety that need to be addressed with animal source foods, as well as, you know, how to limit their environmental impacts. And then we have the enabling environments chapter, which is really around policy and governance. And so how can enabling environments um, be improved for food system approaches for sustainable healthy diets? Some of the findings from that chapter is that these types of uh, environments need to include capacity or improve the capacity to develop policies, implement and enforce laws and regulations, deliver public service, manage trade-offs and mobilize funds for investment. They really have to figure out how to manage trade-offs across nutrition goals and other objectives like increasing GDP, you know, or other kind of trade-offs that governments need to deal with. Um, and then have some ability to deal with corporate influence. There's a lot of lobbying that goes on, especially with ultra-processed foods and, and kind of nutrient-poor foods. So how can governments manage that? Um, and then support for citizens' agency to play a transformative role in leveraging food systems for sustainable, healthy diets. This is something that uh, is increasing where citizens are mobilizing themselves to kind of lobby for their, their own uh, needs. Um, so in conclusion, I think, and so we also have all the regional chapters and, and, and Valeria will present on the regional chapter for, for LAC. Um, but in conclusion, across the uh, GFPR, we found that there is no single intervention. And I think this is something we really want to drive home. There are no like magic bullets or silver bullets or however you want to call them that can, can solve all these problems, right? That's very clear. Um, there's no approach that can, or policy, none of these things on their own can accomplish the type of change we need. I think to achieve sustainable, healthy diets, we need context relevant actions that are interlinked across the food system and supported by good governance to address evolving desirability, affordability, accessibility, and availability constraints. And so here I have these nice pictures from the lab to the seeds to the farm, you know, to the markets and all the way to my, my, my young child eating some tomatoes. So, you know, it's just something that we need to kind of think about. Like you can't just intervene in one of these sections and expect magic to happen, right? You really need to kind of work across the whole system and interlink with other systems to see the change we want. So thanks a lot. magic thank you <laughs> um, thank you um, Diana thanks for um, having us and um, giving me the opportunity to speak about the, the food environment chapter 
Um, food environments um, are really is that space where the consumer meets the food system, where choices are made about what is being purchased to eat, what is being consumed. Um, food environments around the world are rapidly changing, and that's why we uh, put a chapter together on on this topic in this report. Um, the changes relate to um, the fact that households now purchase most of the food they consume uh, and not produce it themselves anymore. Um, rapid ur urbanization and rural transformation um, have led to changes in, in what consumers prefer to eat. And another big change is that because of um, how people work, income earning opportunities, uh, that has really increased the demand for convenience. Um, and the um, private sector, the food industry, has really um, embraced that change and, and come up with new products that are now available. Another big change is the, the digital food environment, which is rapidly expanding. People um, order food from their phones. Uh, what we also see is that social media platforms are increasingly used to promote uh, foods, and the foods that are promoted are disproportionately the unhealthy foods. Um, and, and so this whole development of the internet and how uh, the private sector is engaging with the internet to promote food has really added a layer of complexity to, to food environments. So there is a rapid change and unfortunately uh, food environments change in and of itself is not bad, but unfortunately food environments are also unhealthy. And one of the key issues here is the, uh, the abundance of ultra processed foods. Um, they're widely available in urban and remote rural areas. Um, often we think that they are related to uh, the development of modern retail, such as um, supermarkets. But it turns out that when you travel to even remote areas, you find these ultra-processed foods in, in even the smallest um, stores and tienditas, which is convenient to the owners because they're, they're um, shelf-stable. They, they last for a very long time, so it's easy to store them and, and to sell them. Um, these foods are heavily marketed, um, and there again we see that uh, children and adolescents are uh, very often the target of that, of that marketing. Um, a challenge globally is that the supply chain for foods that we would like people to consume more of, fresh foods, um, are very often long and fragmented um, with issues related to temperature, transportation, and so on. I think that challenge is probably a bit less of an issue for uh, the Latin America region, uh, but still the, the, the problem there is that people miss the, the knowledge and the, uh, the, the resources to purchase these foods. So what can we do to make food environments more healthful? Um, we believe that policies here are instrumental um, to make the food environment uh, healthier and to promote sustainable healthy diets. Um, we have a few examples of uh, policies that work, um, and the first two uh, mandatory front of package labeling and taxes for unhealthy foods um, have been um, successfully implemented and tested, um, and the Latin American region has been really at the forefront of, um, of this development. Um, Restrictions on marketing of unhealthy foods, especially uh, when it comes to children and adolescents. Um, there is guidance out there, but very few countries have, have implemented that, and the evidence base uh, on that is much more limited. Um, policies and actions to promote uh, the consumption of healthy foods, that's another option. Um, but again, the evidence base there is, is very limited. We know very little about what works. In all of this, um, there are no magic bullets, and, and making this work will require coordinated, um, sustained efforts from many different um, stakeholders to not only implement and enforce and evaluate policies, but also to sustain them. We can now see that countries like Mexico, for instance, are uh, struggling with policies that are on the books, are being fought by people who want those policies to disappear again. So it's not that once something is implemented, it's there forever, you know, you need to the, the action to keep it sustained, to, to sustain the policy. So in conclusion, food environments in both rural and urban settings are undergoing a rapid transformation. Uh, the rich experience on policies to um, keep people away from sugar-sweetened beverages, ultra-processed foods, and so on, um, could help countries in, in other regions to uh, also implement those policies. 
a, a new frontier is really that digital food environment uh, where we, we have challenges measuring what is happening and then developing policies and enforcing those is going to be um, a, a big challenge with one we need to look into. Um, and then the recipe for success, um, it sounds pretty simple, it's just one bullet, but uh, <laughs> what it basically says, that last bullet, is that um, we need to kind of work on individual and household level barriers, and those relate to, to knowledge and preferences and affordability. Um, we need to implement policies, and those relate a bit more to the, to the supply and the availability of, of um, foods. And then we also need to work with the industry to enforce accountability. Um, and that's my last slide. Thank you so much. Bueno, eh, muy buenas tardes a todos y buenos días para alguien que nos vea tal vez en algún otro momento de la historia. Soy Valeria Piñeiro, and I will switch to English so we do it all, all at once. Um, I am going to present the chapter on Latin America and the Caribbean that uh, I wrote with uh, Eugenio Díaz Bonilla. And again, it follows the same uh, almost structure and concept as the ones that Diana and Jeff already uh, mentioned today. So it has the same kind of a structure but it is um, emphasizing or focus on uh, Latin America and the Caribbean to really try to acknowledge the differences that we will expect to see in this region compared to uh, other ones, so that it will be a little bit more uh, context specific. So just I would like to start with uh, putting uh, Latin America a little bit in context, and in these cases, just with the rest of the world. And um, for Latin America, I think that the current challenges uh, that we see is that we have high and rising food inflation. Since uh, 2019, the food inflation in Latin America and the Caribbean has definitely escalated, uh, exacerbated by COVID-19, but also with the Ukraine crisis that hit it not only the commodities um, itself, but also the inputs that were used in producing the uh, food. Um, as we all know, inflation really erodes uh, the purchasing power. Um, so it would create is, um, more issues with food uh, security and obviously limiting the access to nutritious uh, foods more than anything. When um, the cost of food increases, people try to go to the cheaper ones. So we've seen a big in uh, increase in staple consumption in Latin America compared to healthy foods more than anything started it in, that, in those uh, last years. And the other one is the uh, economic downturn um, disproportionately impacts the um, low-income groups. And in Latin America, income inequality is really big. It has uh, the highest average level of income inequality globally. So it's, it's, we're very uh, um, um, affected by that. And then obviously the poverty and economic in, uh, impact, it, which we see that poverty affected um, 185 million people in Latin America in 2019. But then with the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, uh, led by a um, almost 7% GDP decline and um, also pushed 17 million more people into poverty. So the region really faces the highest cost of a healthy diet globally. Also, Diana mentioned that. So in terms of uh, producing it, um, we are definitely uh, high, high top on that. Not necessarily the amount of people that it's affected by, but yes, the cost of that. And then there are regional differences. So there are some sub-regions uh, and countries within LAC uh, that experience various uh, varying costs and affordability of healthy diets. So we have to look at Latin America and the Caribbean, but we also have to be looking at the differences um, um, inside the, um, in their own countries. And then I would like to emphasize two things. One, in terms of uh, nutrition and, and health, um, in terms of this putting it in context. One is the nutrition transition that we see which we see the, uh, what actually just Jeff mentioned, which is the high rates of urbanization and higher uh, incomes have really led to obesity changes, and, but the undernutrition and micronutrient deficiencies are still an issue in Latin America. So is that zigzag that we didn't see uh, in, the, in the region. And then the obesity rates in LAC also are higher than global averages. So we see that 24% of adults were obese in 2016 compared to 13 worldwide. And also 8% of children under five in LAC were overweight uh, compared to 5.5 uh, globally. So that is definitely a, a difference. And then in the undernourishment and poverty, 
indicators such as han uh, hunger, uh, wasting, stunting in children, and extreme poverty are also below global average in lack uh, compared to the world, which I guess that is a, a nice one. And then some country specific issues, we have obesity, uh, most common in Argentina, Chile, Mexico, Uruguay, and some Caribbean countries with around 25 or higher prevalence of higher. Uh, but then undernutrition we see more prevalent in Haiti, Venezuela, and several Central American uh, countries. So here my point is that tailored solutions are definitely needed. Uh, addressing these issues requires understanding and responding to the diverse realities uh, in each of the subregions and countries itself. So what can we done? And here I think that we'll follow the same structure from the report. First, we're going to see at the demand side uh, solutions um, where we can see that there's um, we need to really look at the issue in a comprehensive view. Um, so we really need to address the undernutrition with the micronutrient deficiencies and obesity to improve access to the affordability of diverse and healthy diets. So we have to look at it the whole um, point uh, as a holistic point of view. Um, we need to define the targets and objectives, so we really need to be able to identify uh, the affected groups and set quantitative nutrition objectives and establish a clear time frame for achieving these targets. And then the data collection uh, needs, which is also lacking in some of the Latin American countries, not all of them, but some of them have definitely uh, issues with, um, with data collection. So I think see two important uh, needs for Latin America. The first one is to um, have social safety nets uh, in a better design to really try to help this uh, problem. And it's to solve the problem of undernutrition and economic access. So um, we have the solution for this problem in a way could be the cash transfers program. Um, Latin America, as it was mentioned, was pioneer in um, in having these kind of uh, programs, and they were really successful in combating uh, poverty and inequality. But there is a need for expanded coverage and the redesign of the social protection programs and implement the double or multi-double actions to address the malnutrition and the high cost of the, nutrient, uh, the nutritious diet. So we have that, that extra problem uh, in designing this. Then we need to be better in targeting and efficiency of these programs. As we mentioned previously, uh, Latin America also has a big problem of fiscal deficit, so we need to make sure that they are really efficient in improve the targeting currently. Um, uh, to have a social safety net funds to go to the non-poor right now, so we really need to expand this program to be able to, to, to cover more. And then the other thing is to make sure that we are good in being um, ready when shocks come by. So for example, for COVID-19, Brazil was very successful in being there at the very moment, and they didn't have reductions in poverty, increases in poverty like the other countries, just because they had a system that it was working so that they knew who to target uh, um, and they were ready for that. And then the school meal programs, um, we need to really, there are many successful stories in Latin America. Ideally, we will need to be able to cover that more into a nutritious way and as well to uh, linking it with um, local procurement uh, for, for small farmers. So, so that could be something to, to really work. And then the other um, need for lack is to really increase the demand for healthy food and to solve the problem of nutrition transition that I just mentioned. So there's been this shift to cheap and calorie dense diets, uh, which they really lack nutrients. And so we need to and combine that with a new lifestyle that also Jeff was mentioning, it's, it's really uh, the problem we are seeing. So some of the solutions could be really uh, to look at, um, first of all, get better in policy interventions. So we need to really incre increase the demand for the healthy food, reduce the ultra processed food consumption, and create uh, this conducive food environment for the, uh, for the healthy choices. So some of the solutions that, that are there are some taxes, um, um, again, as it was already mentioned, and also some regulations for labeling. And here the success story, and Gabi will tell us later, is the labeling that has been done in Chile, which it was really successful in some ways, and it's covered in the report in the chapter two and three for that. But we also need to make sure that we include into the solution the gender component um, and address the difference impacts on men and women um, 
One fact, for example, is that obesity affects more women, 28%, than men, which is only 20% in Latin America. So when we really try to decide, when we're designing the policies, we really to acknowledge also these differences because the, the uh, solution will be uh, obviously not the same. And then there are some additional approaches like work on uh, alternative transportation methods, like, I don't know, um, if you go to Holland, everybody bikes, for example, now that I look at Jeff, that's uh, something like that. So there are some other, other things that uh, should try to help into reducing these um, uh, sedentary lifestyles that we're going towards. And then if we look at the supply side, more than anything, um, the goal obviously is to have the uh, right amount of calories, the essential nutrients, and the diverse uh, foods for various food groups are necessary for the active life that we should all have. So I see that we have uh, two, two components, I guess. One is the, um, the fiscal challenges that I was uh, mentioning. Um, so all Latin American countries are going through uh, problems with uh, fiscal deficits and, and having increases in, in, in expenditures. But despite that, it's really important that we keep addressing the cost of affordability of healthy diets through policy interventions. But it's this extra need now to make sure that all these new interventions that we do, they are the most efficient ones for that, because we don't have enough money to be spending uh, all around, so we need to be very respectful of that. Uh, when we looked at the availability and diverse food, uh, the challenge is limited availability of these diverse foods contributions to micronutrient differences. So deficiencies, sorry. So that's why I included this map here uh, that we did for, for another uh, project, but that would um, show us is the food production diversity. So these maps, what it covers, it shows the number of major food groups for which national production is insufficient. So we have nine food groups and it's a combination. So what it shows is that the darker colors are the ones that has less diversity in production. Uh, Latin America, as you can see, has more diversified production compared to most developing countries, except for uh, Venezuela, but also those are particular reasons for that. And we think that also inter-regional trade can play a role in obtaining these diverse diets throughout the year also. So this diversity also is very seasonal sometimes, so the reliance on trade, and I will cover that a little bit later, but that's, that's one important thing. And then the second one is the accessibility and affordability. So the strategy could be to increase production and diversity of these healthy uh, foods, and then stabilize and reduce the consumer prices. Um, so that goes to what it was said previously, work on the income, but as well as the cost of the food. So the investment in agricultural and d focusing on fruits, vegetables, legumes, and nuts, and also prom uh, promote the local orphan crops, such as quinoa uh, in Bolivia and Peru, was a very successful story uh, in really covering all these things. It really increased the income of the producers, and as, at, at the same time, it really increased the consumption of this uh, food that is definitely more nutritious than just plain maize, for example. And then support to family farms and home gardens. Again, it brings to the diversity of production and to link the short supply chain so that we have less, less risk in that and increase uh, household um, incomes and um, enhancing maybe local affordability and healthy diets. And also that's covered in chapter three from the uh, uh, report. And then the public procurement schemes, um, considering also the gender aspects, uh, Brazil, for example, had uh, one program that is called Food Acquisition Program, where 40% of suppliers are women. They made a change um, some time ago to really acknowledge and try to include that gender part into this uh, kind of thing. And then the role of trade, um, that is really important in this case for Latin America and the Caribbean, which it helps the uh, boosting the diversity and availability ensure food safety as well, because it's science-based standards uh, through that could be, mitigate also the variability and volatility in food supply, and it could strengthen the intra-regional trade in lack to um, uh, also diversity of diet, as I mentioned previously. And just to, to conclude, um, and I think that I'm just going to read the last paragraph from the report because I couldn't summarize it better even though I thought about it, but I decided that this is the best way we can say, and it says, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean faces the complex challenge of identifying the most effective policies and standards 
associated with developing efficient and balanced national food systems that can meet the growing demand for food while ensuring environmental sustainability, food safety, nutrition quality, and economic and social sustainability. Clearly defining objectives, strengthening social protection programs, addressing the drivers of obesity and overweight, and increasing the availability and affordability of nutritious foods, including through trade. We all contribute to more sustainable healthy diets in the region while maintaining and expanding the crucial role lack plays in global food security and nutrition. And last, the importance of context-specific approaches in tackling food security and nutrition challenges. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to Diana, Jeff, and Valeria. Very interesting uh, presentations and a lot of food for thought uh, for this seminar. Now I want to um, give the microphone over to Carolina Trivelli, principal researcher uh, del Instituto de Estudios Peruanos, uh, to comment on the presentations and the report. Carolina, we're very pleased to have you with us today. So please give us your, your thought on, on the different uh, presentations. Uh, thank you, Lina. Uh, I cannot turn on my camera by some Maybe you can do it, but I, I'm here. Uh, and I will switch to Spanish. Uh, sorry for that, but I was told I could do it. It, it, it makes it a lot easier. Oh, now I can put my camera. Okay, here I am. Um, buenas tardes, buenos días. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Um, muy pertinente traer el tema a la discusión y ojalá logremos que en la región este se vuelva un, un tema de debate más continuo. ¿no? Eh, creo que justamente la coyuntura de los últimos años nos abre la oportunidad de abrir una discusión en la región sobre el tema, el proceso inflacionario, el las restricciones fiscales y todas las consecuencias de los años post pandemia abren una oportunidad y han vuelto a traer este tema a la discusión en la región, porque a diferencia de otros momentos en los que vimos situaciones de estrés fiscal o de incrementos en la pobreza, esta vez ambas situaciones están acompañadas de un incremento en inseguridad alimentaria, cambios en los patrones de consumo y una afectación en particular de las capacidades eh, de consumo de alimentos saludables en los estratos de menores recursos. Entonces tengo cuatro o cinco comentarios muy puntuales para aprovechar los, lo, los minutos que tengo, que quisiera hacer a, a, a lo que han presentado los, los colegas y a lo que está en el reporte que, que recomiendo sobremanera revisar. Primero, hay que tener, como decía Valeria, mucho cuidado con las diferentes situaciones que hay en las distintas subregiones en América Latina y entre los países. ¿no? Tenemos países compradores netos de alimentos, como el caso del Caribe, tenemos países eh, exportadores netos de alimentos, grandes exportadores de granos y de carne en, en el sur, eh, algunos países con una enorme capacidad agroexportadora de frutas, verduras y alimentos frescos, ¿no? y sin embargo enfrentamos estos problemas de consumo de estos alimentos saludables en muchos de los países. Pensar en que hay que estas recomendaciones se pueden aplicar con la misma combinación en cada una de estas realidades, eh, me, me parecería no solamente un grave error, sino que nos va a llevar a situaciones de, de much, muy poca efectividad. Las condiciones en cada región, en cuanto a su oferta disponible, pero también en cuanto a las características de la demanda, en particular la de menores ingresos, hacen, nos exigen hablar del de, eh, tema que Valeria mencionó, y es además de la heterogeneidad dentro de la región, en cada país lo que tenemos son eh, altísimos niveles de desigualdad. Desigualdad económica, como señaló Valeria, sin duda somos la región más desigual de, del planeta, pero también tienen muchas desigualdades horizontales. Y creo que ahí hay una tarea central que hay que eh, enfrentar de, de, de arranque. ¿no? Eh, primero la, la, la desigualdad de género. 
¿no? El, las cifras que ha presentado en el último par de años la, eh, la FAO, el Programa Mundial de Alimentos y otras instituciones de Naciones Unidas eh, reflejan un incremento y una mucho mayor brecha en seguridad alimentaria entre hombres y mujeres que en el resto de regiones del planeta. Y esa es una señal de alarma muy importante que tenemos que poner al centro de las discusiones sobre cómo queremos enfrentar el desafío de una alimentación más saludable y sostenible. Eh, claramente eh, las mujeres en, en América Latina y el Caribe no solamente están afectadas por problemas de discriminación, de sesgo, sino que cuentan con una dotación eh, menor de, de recursos, activos eh, e ingresos, un menor control sobre esos activos e ingresos y además una escasez de tiempo muy relevante que afecta directamente eh, su capacidad de, de consumo. Eh, en el Perú hemos estado viviendo un incremento tremendo de inseguridad alimentaria y cuando consultamos en encuestas de opinión regularmente a hombres y mujeres sobre cómo han logrado sobrellevar la crisis, la diferencia en respuestas de hombres y mujeres altamente significativa desde eh, el inicio del periodo de alta inflación. Entonces creo que el, el tema de precios relativos sobre el que me voy a referir después es, es una de las claves y mirarlo en relación a los ingresos y al control sobre esos ingresos de hombres y mujeres es clave. Una segunda desigualdad que eh, es muy relevante en la región tiene que ver con el origen étnico, la sobre representación de población con ascendencia indígena y afrodescendientes pero con culturas alimentarias muy distintas a la de eh, las grandes eh, clases medias, eh, abre un desafío y una oportunidad para eh, no pensar que políticas nacionales de alimentación saludable o genéricos pueden ser igualmente efectivos con distintos grupos eh, donde se combinan, donde hay esta intersección entre mayores niveles de pobreza y tradiciones alimentarias diferentes. ¿no? Eh, y lo tercero, el, las enormes diferencias y desigualdades urbanos-rurales. ¿no? Tenemos todavía esta antigua fantasía sobre eh, la, los pobladores del mundo rural teniendo acceso directo a alimentos más sanos y saludables a pesar de su mayor nivel de pobreza y lo que vemos crecientemente es que el grueso de eh, pobladores rurales incluso eh, agricultores son hoy día compradores netos de alimentos en los mercados por lo tanto muy susceptibles a eh, lo, los cambios en eh, los precios y a la oferta de alimentos ultraprocesados, envasados, que hoy día llegan de manera eh, directa a el, el mundo, al mundo rural. Entonces, lentes de desigualdad permanentemente son necesarios. Cuando uno mira, por ejemplo, el consumo de frutas y verduras, los quintiles más acomodados de nuestros países consumen el mínimo recomendado, los quintiles inferiores de la distribución no llegan a consumir ni la mitad de eh, lo recomendado. Entonces, lentes de desigualdad, lentes de desigualdad creo que serían fundamentales para permear el tipo de políticas que hay que hacer. Termino con, con dos cosas muy puntuales. Una, eh, por supuesto, queremos que la gente tenga más recursos para que pueda elegir mejor y pueda comprar aquellos alimentos más saludables, suponiendo que ya hayamos sido exitosos en convencerlos de que, de, que eso es lo mejor para ellos. Eh, pero, y queremos encarecer productos ultraprocesados para desincentivar su consumo. Es, esa, ese manejo de precios relativos es delicado y es complejo el etiquetado ha funcionado en Chile, en Perú, en México y en, en otros países, eh, impuestos, regulaciones, regulaciones sobre publicidad, sobre todo para niños, hay que potenciar y armar, identificar cuál es el paquete mínimo que realmente lo va generar un impacto en, en, en esos procesos. Finalmente, dos puntitos chiquititos. Uno, la creciente importancia en esta región altamente urbanizada del consumo de alimentos fuera del hogar. ¿No? Eso es una cosa que eh, ahora con la vuelta a la presencialidad 
crece rápidamente nuevamente y es ahí también donde hay que prestar atención porque crecientemente una parte importante de los alimentos consumidos por las familias eh, están sucediendo fuera de los hogares y no solo dentro de ellos, ¿no? Y creo que es un sector del cual conocemos poco, ni siquiera sabemos bien cómo medir la calidad nutricional de eh, buena parte de los alimentos consumidos fuera del hogar. Y lo último, eh, por supuesto, protección social, eh, ampliar y mejorar la focalización de las intervenciones de protección social, en particular las de asistencia social, es hoy día un desafío, no solo porque lo que más ha crecido en la región es la pobreza urbana, que es más difícil de eh, identificar, el, la focalización es más compleja, sino eh, por, por la estrechez fiscal que enfrentan casi todos los gobiernos de, de la región. Entonces hay que elegir muy bien las batallas y no esperar eh, ampliaciones, digamos, de cobertura muy, muy grandes. ¿no? Eh, y en esa línea creo que una de las recomendaciones que está en el estudio con la que creo que todos estaremos de acuerdo, que es, por ejemplo, utilizar mejor los programas de alimentación escolar, favoreciendo compras locales, la inclusión de productos frescos. Eh, buena parte de estos programas de alimentación escolar llegan a los hogares en, en situación de mayor eh, necesidad. En el Perú, 50% de la población en situación de pobreza tiene al menos un miembro recibiendo el programa de alimentación escolar. Entonces, hay una conexión muy potente tanto en la provisión de alimentos saludables a, a estos niños como en la creación de cultura alimentaria orientada hacia el consumo de alimentos frescos. Sin embargo, la recomendación de compras locales, que también todos avalamos, potenciamos y queremos lograr, es una, es una recomendación compleja de implementar en una región marcada por una altísima informalidad en los proveedores a nivel local y en una desgraciadamente muy larga historia de problemas con la inocuidad de algunos de los alimentos que eh, no tienen eh, formas de control sobre la calidad y la seguridad. ¿no? Eh, mercados locales son una de las claves que habría que atacar para asegurar que... Eh, esa posibilidad de utilizar mecanismos como eh, la alimentación escolar se vuelva un potenciador de la producción de alimentos saludables, sostenibles, frescos y del consumo de los mismos en las escuelas en particular, en las zonas más deprimidas. Entonces, eh, creo que hay muchísima tarea, pero como bien decía Valeria, necesitamos encontrar la combinación de estas eh, recomendaciones que se adecúa no solo a, cada, a la realidad de cada país, sino a los grupos dentro de cada país que queremos impactar para asegurar que detenemos el, el, el incremento y ojalá reduz, reduzcamos el incremento de sobrepeso y obesidad, pero sobre todo que instalamos una cultura alimentaria que sea conducente a que logremos un, una dieta eh, saludable y sostenible. Así que muchísimas gracias por la invitación y felicitaciones por el reporte y ojalá con, con el BIT logremos mover más esta discusión en, eh, y con IFPRI, esta discusión en la región porque es de la mayor importancia hoy día para millones de habitantes latinoamericanos y del Caribe. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias Carolina, como siempre. Excelentes puntos y muy interesante todos los temas que menciona sobre la cultura alimentaria, los temas de cómo priorizar en este contexto de estrechez fiscal, del manejo de precios relativos. Creo que son todos temas eh, fundamentales para la región y, y bueno, hay que eh, digamos que potencializar las, las políticas, intervenciones para tener un mayor efecto en la seguridad alimentaria de la región. Y bueno, Pasamos ahora al panel, so I'll, I'll switch to English again and uh, please join us for, for a panel discussion to our speakers and also to Gabriela. Well, thank you very much again for 
on your presentations and again uh, congratulations on this very important report I think uh, is a great effort um, for um, you know the the different uh, regions of the world to have compiled in one document all the different types of uh, policies, recommendations, uh, diagnosis, etc. So I think uh, I really want to congratulate our colleagues from IFPRI on this and thank you for coming and uh, giving us a taste of this a very rich report. So um, I really like, uh, I like very much the, uh, how the report uh, addressed the issue of supply and demand separately, but also combined in the environment. Uh, part that, that you mentioned with the place where supply and demand and demand uh, actually meet no so but according to the report uh, making healthy diets more accessible and affordable will require increasing the production and diversity of healthy food in the region clearly so we have that supply side um, which could help to stabilize and even reduce prices for consumers so will have an effect also on demand um, agricultural research and development is key for improving food and nutrition security. But the development of agricultural technologies and innovations have focused mainly on the production side. And I would say that even the institutional arrangements, at least in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, have paid less consideration to the nutritional side uh, of agriculture and production uh, compared to, to, to other regions probably or uh, other countries. Um, so, Diana, I would like to ask you what kind of interventions can be implemented to improve nutrition, both from the demand and supply side, while ensuring environmental sustainability in Latin America? Yeah, thanks for that question. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of the crux of the issue, right? Like, how do you Kind of address all the problems across the food system and, and use solutions uh, that address the multiple barriers. Um, and so, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities, and I think a lot of the solutions were presented, um, both, you know, from um, Jeff and, and Valeria, and also um, from, uh, from the, the last speaker. Um, and I, so I, you know, I don't know that I want to rehash all of it, but I, I think I just would pull out a couple examples. I mean, I think Latin America really has led in kind of the social protection realm and using social protection programs to to solve issues. And I, and I think they they were also at the forefront of trying to use them to solve nutrition problems. I think that's something that could actually be built on, right? Because I think the infrastructure is there, the idea is there, the investments are there. But I think that they still need to be made more effective for nutrition and, and solving multiple nutrition problems. Jeff and I worked in Guatemala on a kind of food aid program that was also supposed to be multi-sectoral health and nutrition, food, you know, but what we found was, it, you know, it was effective on reducing stunting, but it also had an unintended effect on preventing kind of a decrease in, in overweight um, or kind of weight loss um, among uh, women who had just given birth. and so. You know, while these types of solutions can be helpful for addressing undernutrition, they may also have impacts on overnutrition. And I think Jeff also saw similar uh, um, problems in Mexico, right? And so I think that, you know, but the, the basis is there, right? And so I think with some, you know, thoughtful contextualization of addressing the, the problems within the specific country and balancing, you know, the interventions so that you don't, you know, the double duty actions that Valeria mentioned, so that you don't kind of have that unintended negative effect while trying to solve a different problem, I think is is somewhere where Latin America could really lead on. Um, and then I think you know something that we're trying to do right now when one of the new CGIR initiatives is it's kind of using what we call an end to end approach to improving fruit and vegetable intake, for example, where we are working on kind of breeding and biodiversity and genetic innovation working on improving good agriculture practices to improve, uh, reduce water loss and improve soil health and things like that, working directly in food environments and also on increasing demand for nutritious foods, like specifically fruits and vegetables, you know, and I think this model uh, could be applied to other types of commodities, but I think doing it for fruits and vegetables specifically is, is really critical. And right now we're working with USAID Horticulture Innovation Lab, who is working in Guatemala, for example, um, you know, working 
individually across some of those segments, but you know, trying to think about how can we bring this kind of end-to-end -end thinking uh, to the to the region, I think, would be really critical. And and some of those opportunities could be through kind of linking school meals programs with farmers and and seeing how that actually can work. I know WFP is doing a lot of work in that area in the region uh, with small pilots, and you know, it would be interesting to see if that's something that is scalable. I think that's still a very open question. Um, but just to say, I think there's a lot of opportunities to kind of work. You know, both kind of linking other sectors to food systems, but also working across the food system uh, using different types of approaches. So I'll stop there. Sure, go ahead, Valeria. Lina, and I think also to uh, to add or or bring in even a little bit more broader. I think that uh, previously, um, in many many years ago, we always talked about the agricultural sector and what it was to produce. So that was very compartmental into just the agricultural, so it was just the production. I think that now that we're talking about sustainability, sustainability is a broader term. So we have sustainability in the economic, the social, and the environmental as well. So we're including many components. So I think that the narrative now is different, or the vision of what it is, again, the food system, sustainability, they're broader terms. So I think that governments now are really getting the fact that the solutions is not going to be just deal at the Ministry of Agriculture or just at the other minister, that they need to start having a communication, that they need to come up with programs that involves all of their uh, objectives or goals or, or actually uh, job that they have to do. So I think that they are bringing a bigger conversation through them. Thanks. I think it's, it's key what you mentioned, Nona. Um, how can we actually support the coordination of the different sectors to actually reach uh, more efficient and effective interventions in terms of food security and nutrition. And uh, following on that, uh, I would like to ask Jeff, because I know you also co-authored the chapter on animal source foods. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the importance of these uh, animal source foods in the lag region and how uh, sometimes I feel that they have been to some extent demonized, but they are also part of the solution and part of having a healthy diet. So how can we get to that middle ground or this equilibrium balance? Yeah. In your question, you gave away the answer already, I think. <laughs> but I'll repeat it with different words. Uh, so thanks for the question. So yeah, for, starting from the nutrition perspective, animal source foods, um, are rich in high quality proteins and, and micronutrients that are easily, um, can be easily absorbed. So they're excellent foods, especially for um, groups that um, have physiological needs that are high, like young children, pregnant women, and so on. Um, so having those in a diet is, is important if you want to have a complete diet that provides all the nutrients. At the same time, we know that there are um, both human health and environmental health issues uh, related to them. So we know that ultra well processed foods, uh, processed animal source foods um, are unhealthy and actually carcinogenic. Uh, that is clearly established. There is um, strong suggested evidence that red meat is unhealthy, uh, saturated fatty acids as well. So excess consumption can lead to undesirable health effects. And then there is the planetary health uh, component that um, greenhouse gas emissions are high when you produce uh, animal source foods. There is diversity loss, use of water, and so on. So we have a challenge there because some people do not have enough animal source food in their diet and others are eating more than they actually need from a nutritional perspective. So what we conclude in that chapter is what we need is moderation. So those who don't have access to enough need to have access to more. And those of us who uh, consume too much already will have to lower intakes. Um, and it's especially that second part where there is a challenge. I don't think we have any kind of examples of, of countries or population groups that have um, effectively lowered their intake at, at the population level. We don't have good examples of interventions that we could use to do that. but. Uh, the planet is not big enough to have everybody on a US or a European style animal source food diet because that's just not, not sustainable. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, those are uh, very interesting uh, insights. 
Um, Valeria, in the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, how do you think countries can expand local orphan crops to make healthy diets more accessible and affordable? Um, I think you mentioned the example of quinoa, but I don't know if you have any other uh, in mind and how, how can these crops actually play a role into achieving uh, more healthy and nutritious diets? Thank you, Lina, for the question. Um, I actually love to talk about uh, <laughs> with some of your colleagues from the IDB. Um, but in any case, um, we um, we use the the, the uh, example of the quinoa. But I think that going back a little bit into what we think about the forgotten crops, or uh, they have many different names now. Um, but the basic idea is that first of all, they have some. Um, tradition um, or culture related with uh, those crops. Second, uh, in general, they are actually very nutritious. So the case of the quinoa, we have millets as well in Africa, um, and there are some other ones in Asia that it seems to be that they are actually very nutritious compared to other uh, staples. Um, and it also helps in terms of biodiversity loss and some other uh, good environmental indicators that they can uh, uh, favor in. So I think that now it's a, a matter of how we can make them more visible so that they are more attractive in terms of the demand so that people actually consume them. Um, so it's about marketing and all that, but also on the production side of how you can make them um, be economically um, successful for the producers. And for that, you need to obviously have market access you need to also invest in R&D. You need to also have some intellectual property as attached to those seeds uh, properly done. So there's some work to be done. In the case of quinoa, it was a very successful story for uh, Peru and Bolivia now. They are um, um, uh, one of the um, um, higher exporters of, of that. It has also some transition period in which you have to be able to support the producers in order to actually uh, increase their production. Uh, one one thing that it happened also is how in the transition it seems that um, exports increase quite a lot, uh, but domestic population were really consuming a lot of quinoa. That prices went up and they actually had a problem. So that it needed to have some kind of governmental intervention to fix that problem in the short term. But in the long term, um, it really increased uh, production of quinoa very successfully. Uh, what it has been proving also is that now that um, prices have stabilized and, and things, uh, what also it shows is that the um, producers actually invested a lot in um, technology and now the yields actually are having um, been even stable. So it really increased for some time, but now are stable. So it was also a successful story in terms of uh, production as well. But there are other cases, for example, maize, they have different color of maize that they are called uh, forgotten. There's the um, um, acai, but I maybe I'm not pronouncing it properly in Brazil. And there are many other uh, good stories. I don't know if you have another one, no? No, that's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's very important what you mentioned and also just talking about these different cultures of, uh, you know, um, Alimentación, <laughs> culturas de alimentación, I, I like the term that Carolina used. Um, how this can also be extrapolated into, you know, the general public without hurting the producers. And and following on this point, um, and talking about these vulnerable populations, I would like to ask Gabriela, um, when we think about women, children, migrants, indigenous populations, um, we know they are the most affected by food insecurity, and this is something that Carolina also mentioned, no? Those, this uh, inequality uh, that we face in, in the region specifically. So, Gabriela, what do you think can be um, a, a, a good practice to, to create this more inclusive food system that really puts the needs of the most uh, vulnerable populations in the front and center? Yeah. Thank you so much, Lina, for that question, which I think is um, a bit difficult to answer. It's very broad, but um, I will do my best. Uh, so I think that several approaches can be used um, yeah, to, to 
to include these people uh, in, in the decision making, starting from the decision making processes. So from promoting community participation to understand their needs to generating evidence on what are the, uh, the interventions, the tailored interventions that really work um, for each of these populations because the needs for women can be very different from the needs from children or indigenous peoples or migrant or the migrant population. So starting with empowerment and participation, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we need to ensure that vulnerable groups are actively involved uh, in uh, decision-making processes regarding the food and nutrition policies and programs. Uh, for example, initiatives like uh, community-led agriculture projects where women uh, and indigenous um, communities can have a voice uh, and uh, yeah, speak from, for, for their communities. Uh, second, uh, as Carolina also mentioned, uh, tailored intervention and programs. So uh, because these, each of these populations have different needs, uh, we really need to develop targeted uh, interventions that address the specific challenges faced by each of these uh, groups. Uh, and this could involve, for example, subsidizing nutritious foods so they have more access, they can be uh, work on the affordability, as Diana already mentioned as well. Uh, um, and probably use some of the existing uh, delivery platforms uh, to uh, to deliver these programs. Uh, so, for example, through social protection programs, uh, and that yeah, that the Latin American region already has a uh, experience uh, in this. Uh, and last, um, uh, about uh, I want to talk about uh, education and awareness, which is also very important. Uh, to promote education on uh, nutrition, health, uh, and um, sustainable farming practices, for example, um, within these communities. Uh, and this could involve, for example, nutrition education programs that can be implemented in schools, uh, so starting from yeah, childhood. Uh, so these uh, children and adolescents can also bring this knowledge to their households uh, and, yeah, and com uh, contribute to the decision making at some point. Um, uh, but also, this can um, include uh, in, uh, providing healthcare services uh, that cater to specific, specific needs of women and children, for example, uh, and using the, um, the platforms that are already in place, like uh, Latin America has um, in the health sector has um, a very well established uh, primary care system in several countries. So those um, platforms can be used, for example, to deliver um, health services. Um, so by implementing some of these strategies, um, of course, not only one, uh, but a, a, um, yeah, a, a, this group of strategies or like a package, as also Carolina mentioned, there's we need to know or we need to assess which uh, is the minimum package that is needed uh, to really move toward, towards a more inclusive food systems and uh, make sure that uh, these vulnerable, vulnerable populations' uh, needs are covered uh, and also uh, to empower them um, to be resilient in the face, in, if they face at some point uh, food insecurity challenges. I will leave it there. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, two quick comments on what I've heard, if I may, um, on the education part and, and increasing knowledge of consumers. Um, I think we, in all of this, nothing is easy and uh, we, we cannot be naive. Uh, it's important for consumers to know what's healthy, um, but we know that the forces out there um, of the big food companies are much larger than what we can afford from the public sector. I may have gotten, I think there's a 2019 statistic for the US. Um, CDC spent about a billion dollars, I think, on promoting healthy diets and the food industry, um, was it 17 or 19 million? Um, so many times more, it's, it's really hard to fight that unless you say, well, it becomes illegal to promote unhealthy foods. I mean, I think we need to think more about those types of solutions. And then another, I, I want to make sure that we're on the same page. We've talked about um, food security. Um, and I think what we're trying to do in the report goes a step further. Um, it's about healthy diets. Um, consumers are not opposed to becoming food secure, and they will happily join you in that, in that um, um, process. But when it comes to healthy diets, you start to um, 
also have to think about culture and preferences and what we've seen in the Latin America region with the conditional cash transfer programs is that diets became more diverse. People choose to eat more fruits and vegetables, animal source foods, but they also choose to consume more energy beyond what is strictly needed. So that leads to problems of overweight and obesity. So getting healthy diets, yes, it's resource availability, affordability, but there's many other factors that play into that as well as, as Diana pointed out. So the bar is higher than for food security, I guess. That's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, that's an excellent point, and, and I think that's why there's been this con consensus on now talking about food security and nutrition, not, not only focusing on the food security side. And I think that's very important, especially in Latin America and the Caribbean. I think we have some questions online. Um, Soledad, I don't know if you could help us with Yes, uh, we have 300 people connected online from several countries in the region. And here's one question for anyone from IFPRI. How can we promote food education practices and awareness of nutrition and healthy eating in LAC countries and take measures that go beyond taxes or restrictions? How can we create positive incentives for dietary behaviors to reduce control and prevent malnutrition, both in the community and in the industry. It's a very simple question. Or <laughs> I, I, maybe I can start. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't think it's it's either or. And, and with the example I just gave about the budgets that go to um, promoting healthy versus unhealthy eating. Um, I think that just doing education in schools or the general public will get us where we need to be. So I do think we need regulation. We need to make it um, harder for people to be seduced basically by those foods. I mean, you go out, we, we did research in, in Hanoi and the um, when adolescents walk out of the door, in Hanoi itself, it's the mean distance to the, the closest ultra processed food or soft drink is 32 meters. So it's a dangerous world out there. That's really how we need to think about this. And it's hard to not consume these foods because they're everywhere. So I, I do think some regulation is needed in addition to educating people about um, healthy diets. Not just one of these, I don't think is going to give us what we need. Yeah. I completely agree with that, Jeff, and I think that, um, as you already said, uh, it's a package of interventions, what we need, and I think that Chile is a good example of uh, uh, what, uh, what they did to promote uh, or to make this food environment more helpful. So all the restrictions, we know the labeling, the restrictions on marketing, etc., but also at the school level, um, uh, this, this, um, these uh, policies were also implemented and complemented with the education. So uh, there are some, uh, there is some evidence that shows that children were basically uh, agents of change um, and they delivered this information to their households and uh, contributed to, to making, to, yeah, to make more uh, healthy um, choices at the household level. Uh, and that education component uh, needs to be reinforced and sustained over time to not lose uh, the momentum and the, yeah, uh, for, to make those changes at, at the individual level. Thanks. And that's uh, very, very, you know, I think it's, it's nice how you put it because you talk about the supply and also the demand as well, Gabriela. And I'm going to take advantage the, of the fact that I know about Valeria's research and I want to ask her on trade because I think that, and then we'll go to the last question from the public, so I'm sorry, I'm taking advantage of that as well. And Marisol has a question, but give, ah, and, and Gonzalo, so yeah, I'm actually really taking time. So I just want to ask you on the issue of trade. I mean, because to me, also the fact of having this access to maybe unhealthy diets, ultra processed foods, could be a consequence of trade, but at the same time, trade, trade could be um, a solution to the problem. So tell us a little bit about that. What, what, what do you think? I 
think that that is totally true. Uh, like as everything that we've mentioned in here, there's no right or wrong, right or wrong, or or the final uh, decision to, to that. So um, trade, I am a big believer in trade in many aspects. The first one is that uh, if we looked at uh, natural resources, not every country has the same endowments of natural resources. So not every country should be producing everything. So we really need to be very uh, conscious about it. Um, the same thing, um, um, gas emissions, for example, that it is something that we are all affected by. So it's not only who produces it, but it, it affects the whole world. So we need to be very conscious about that and trade has a role in making this more efficient in terms of that. Uh, something that I mentioned today is about the um, diet diversity that is key in for, for a healthy diet, and trade can contribute to that as well. Um, so you may think that it is a good or a bad thing, but we can eat avocado all year round here in Washington, D.C. Again, it may not be a good thing, but in terms of diet diversity, it definitely uh, contributes to that. So I think that we just need to, to make sure that we try to emphasize the good things and try to, to avoid the other ones. Um, taxes are a good thing, so the same thing. If you don't want to be importing a lot of ultra-processed uh, foods, you can just uh, increase um, our taxes. But it doesn't trade. That shouldn't be the solution, because if you tax imports, you just will just switch to domestic per, uh, consumption of domestic product. So that is not really the good uh, intervention in order to accomplish that. So the way I see it is trade is always a positive thing in this way because, again, if you want to consume a, I know, a bottle of Coke, it doesn't matter if it comes from uh, Mexico or the U.S., uh, you still have some soda available out there to consume. So. Thank you, Valeria. Marisol and Gonzalo. Maybe we can take both questions and then the answers. Thank you very much for all the presentations. They were very nice. Uh, I was very interested, Jeff, in what you said, because uh, labeling, that's just information that we're making it public for the consumer to decide. Uh, taxes, subsidies, economic incentives. Uh, but the restriction on the marketing of unhealthy foods for children and adolescents, that seems very hard. So I don't know if you can give us a, a couple of good practices of examples of where it worked and how did people react to that? Thank you so much for the presentation. And I wanted to pick up on a point that was made about moving away from unhealthy food or from ultra processed food, which of course uh, we all agree about that. But I was thinking that we talk a lot of moving away from that, reducing consumption, but that also means uh, lower, pro lower the production. And as you said, the size of the industry is way, way bigger than we would like to be. But that would be, mean also less jobs in the sector. Are we thinking about maybe a transition plan for if there's a reconversion from the industry or are there workers that are moving to a new side? The how long that would be taking? I'm not saying that we should have a question that is mostly a, a, a food for thoughts that after hearing this, it's like when we some countries decide to stop subsidizing some sector, there's a transition period and there's a risk associated with the workers that moving from one size to another and maybe how long that would, would take. So just a food for thought. Thank you for the presentation. I think I can take the question about marketing restrictions. Uh, so I think uh, so far in Latin America, Chile and Mexico have some evidence on, uh, on what worked uh, in those countries and basically um, what work is at the product level. So in Chile, for example, the, um, there is a, ch a like famous chocolate brand that presented their product with a, a toy attached to it. So that was banned completely. So basically that product is not available in Chile anymore. 
uh, and several other yeah characters, cartoon characters. Everything was completely banned um, from at the product level, but not only at the product level, uh, but also at the uh, in different media. So uh, on TV advertisement, yeah, that is uh, put on TV at specific uh, times of the day where children are more yeah in front of the TV. Uh, and uh, but the restrictions were. Uh, yeah, went beyond only uh, TV and also cover um, uh, the internet, so social media, etc. What is difficult to know until now is if uh, in to do is uh, monitoring. Uh, yeah, that is actually that everything is actually um, being enforced, uh, especially in the in, in in the internet and social media. Um, I think that that's where the challenge is, uh, like to measure if this is really being enforced. At the product level, there is evidence that is, is working and that the, the food industry really is um, uh, uh, yeah, following the, the regulations in these two countries. Um, and I think that uh, to the uh, point uh, that you raised about uh, the, the losing the jobs and moving away, uh, there is also evidence that the industry, uh, it doesn't happen. Yeah, it, it, yeah, there is nothing that is happening with the jobs. Uh, they remain the same, but what the industry is doing is uh, reformulating their products and moving away from adding sugar. And uh, so they are replacing the sugar with um, other types of sweeteners. That, that's another whole story that we don't know what can, will happen in a few years, but they are trying to, uh, to adapt and to reformulate it to offer like uh, healthier products or yeah, healthier products or products with less sugars, fat, sodium, whatever. Um, but uh, there's still a lot, a lot of work to do, uh, and also, uh, yeah, we, um, yeah, it's. But uh, yeah, I think that that's. Um, uh, I don't know, Jeff, if you want. Yeah, very quickly. So labeling um, primarily is information, right, for the consumer. But we, the, the evidence is there that the industry has followed very quickly to reformulate their products because they wanted to avoid, by all means, to have the black octagonal kind of stop sign on the front of their package. So there is behavior change from the industry perspective as well. Um, and then on the, the transition period, um, it's an interesting question. I, I was first wondering whether you were from the food industry because it's one of the arguments they have used. Uh, we have a box, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we have a box in, in the chapter, uh, the four Ds, uh, deny, divide, deflect, and delay, uh, that the industry has used in, in all of these countries to basically say, we can't do this because it's, it's taking us too long, we need more time, and you're basically killing the industry. And, and the research that has been done on that shows that that is not the case. And just to add one thing is they've been reformulating their products, but also changing the size, so the, the, the portion of, of, of things as well. So that's an, another way they have to. Okay, <laughs> so well, I think it was a very lively discussion and I think there are more questions from the public and also online, but uh, we're gonna stop here and maybe we'll try to, to reach you for a later seminar or something like that, because it seemed to be very interesting for everybody here. Again, I wanna thank you all for coming and um, thank you for being at the IDB and sharing this uh, important report with us. And uh, well, you know, this is your house and thank you very much again for, for being with us. Thank you. <laughs>